So Kirby's Return to Dream Land Deluxe has been out for a little while now with ads for the game being absolutely everywhere. And I mean everywhere. Like these things have been inescapable for the last few weeks. Now you're probably asking if I'm planning on buying it or not and well, I already own it. I've had a little bit of history with this game for those of you who are familiar with the old Aiden 548. If you're in the know, kudos to you. Why have you stuck around for this long? But I'm assuming that many of you are probably unfamiliar with the old Aiden 548, especially since all the videos and evidence of that are now private. What a pussy, I know. But basically when this was a gameplay-centric channel, Kirby's Return to Dreamland was the first ever series that I started. Notice how I said started. Honestly, when you're stacking a ton of boxes on top of each other just so your phone can align with the tall-ass TV, it kinda gets tiresome. I also didn't know what the fuck I was doing. And so for the beginning of my channel, it was much easier to do 3DS games where I could do it like this. And for that reason, Kirby Planet Robobot was the first series on this channel that I actually completed. It was also a game that I had completed months earlier when it actually came out. So unlike the Planet Robobot series, my first time playing Return to Dreamland was in those two videos, which is just crazy to me. Obviously two 20 minute playthroughs did not get me super far in the game, which does beg the question, did I ever go back to this game on my own time to complete it? No. Look, I mean, I did technically go back and play it, getting yay far, but this was the farthest I've ever gotten in this game my entire time of owning it, which has been like since 2016. Does that mean I'm finally gonna sit down and complete it? Uh, no, so as you can see right here, the Wii, right here, the Wii console, here's the, here's the game in question. Uh, the Wii, unfortunately, as you can see, it's not on. It's kinda unplugged. Look, I don't think this game is bad by any means, I just don't feel compelled to play it right now. I mean, eventually, yes, I will beat this game with like the other 50 games that I've started and just haven't finished, it's just that in the entirety of the Kirby series, this one isn't all that memorable. I mean, the game had an extremely long and interesting development history which spanned almost a decade, but looking back, it really is basic even by today's standards. I mean, even then, it's not like we didn't have any Kirby games between 64 and Returns, it's just that they weren't any mainline releases on a home console. This doesn't count, and even if we do count that, Kirby's Epic Yarn did release a year prior to Returns. Even still, I'm not gonna go out and spend $60 on a game I already own. This is different, I don't know. For me, I still have two gripes with this remaster. For one, I don't think it looks all that great, particularly when it comes to these thick outlines. Like, you guys had an engine from Star Allies that you could have used. Why change it up? It looked fine. I mean, I don't think they were going for this look that was used in an earlier prototype for this game, but if they truly did, and I mean truly did, that's a really deep cut and I really appreciate it. I'll allow it, but I don't think that's the case. I also don't like the new DDD design. I know it showed up in the Forgotten Land, but it's weird. His face is small. Where the fuck is his beak? Look, I love Kirby games, but even I can admit that they're all very similar to one another. Like, you play one, you kind of played them all. And since the only reason we were given for another Wii remaster, why do they keep doing this, is for Kirby's 30th anniversary. And I'm not too sure this was the best choice. Look, Kirby is basic, but even this is a little too basic. Why we couldn't have a few other remasters is beyond me, but if Nintendo wants to remaster a few more Kirby games in the future, I won't be in their way stopping them. I don't know, like, is this the best game they could have chosen to celebrate Kirby's 30th anniversary? Scratch that 31st. I smell a loophole! Nintendo hasn't really had the best track record when it comes to celebrating their franchises over the last few years. I mean, Mario's 35th was mediocre at best, Zelda's was a slap in the face, and this one just feels like they were obligated to do it. To be fair, Metroid's 35th and Donkey Kong's 40th were completely skipped out on and ignored in 2021. However, Metroid did have a big year in 2021 despite no acknowledgement of the 35th anniversary. Instead, we got the release of the downright most notorious lost game out there, Metroid Dread. And if I'm being honest, I would rather just get a new game with no celebration rather than a half-assed Wii port and a Game & Watch, but that's just me. In fact, we saw something similar with Mario's 30th back in 2015 with the release of Super Mario Maker. Sure it was tied in technically, but that's all we got besides like two amiibo. But it was a step in the right direction for what fans truly wanted. Nintendo didn't hand us a new Super port and say have fun, they actually made a game that many fans truly thought they would never get. And honestly, the same can be said for Kirby with last year's Kirby and the Forgotten Land. There's that loophole. For the last 30 years of this series' existence, Kirby has remained an exclusively 2D franchise. Sure, there have been some spin-offs that took advantage of the third dimension, but never has there been a mainline Kirby game that's been in 3D. I mean, there have been little teases here and there of what a true 3D Kirby game could look like, but never a fully-fledged 3D outing. That was until the release of Kirby in the Forgotten Land last year. I'll be honest, at first I was a little reluctant to buy another Kirby game for the Switch, but once I saw this on Instagram, I knew I had to get it, and... Wow. This... 
This is one hell of a game. Now, I know the idea of a 3D Kirby game before this sounded like a huge change for the franchise, but honestly, after playing The Forgotten Land, it really isn't that much of a change. Kirby controls the way you would expect. The huge leap here is in its level design. Kirby games are not particularly known for their level design, they're fairly basic with the only goal to get to the end and do your little dance. But here, despite the cliched grass, beach, snow, sand, and lava world, all of them feel very memorable, and most importantly, have purpose. Despite the level design borrowing the more linear structure of 3D World, its usage of the post-apocalyptic setting surprisingly fits really well, making these levels much more memorable as a result. Instead of you roaming the basic green greens, you're going through abandoned buildings like skyscrapers and malls. It's a really cool aesthetic, and although I'm biased because I tend to really like sections of games like this, these levels are all really cool. Out of all the six worlds in the game, the one that stands out to most to me is Wild Horns, this game's Snow World. The music, the subway, the London style city, oh my god, it is all so good. This is peak Kirby. Where the fuck is his beak? And of course, just as everyone else is obligated to talk about it, I have to mention something about Wondaria. See, Kirby games typically have those basic world themes that I discussed earlier, but usually have one dedicated to something a bit more unique. Here, it's not just an amusement park you're exploring, it's an abandoned amusement park. And oh my god, it is so much fun. For the most part, every level here has its place, with each level almost feeling like a separate chapter to an overarching story that's presented in each world. But it does almost leave me wanting more. See, when I first played this game, I thought I had only just scratched the surface when going to the second continent, and yep, it's already over. I don't know. To me, the game just seems to end super abruptly. Don't get me wrong, the last world was kind of intense for a Kirby game, but I feel like it could have been a world or two longer. And the final boss. What is this? See, out of all the things Kirby games have in common, one of my favorite is the really fucked up final boss. This line, it ain't it. And this thing, looks like it's straight out of a modern Sonic game. I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just saying it's out of place. We'll, we'll talk about that later, but for right now, let's cover the more overlooked aspects of this game. Nowadays, it's almost a necessity for a modern platformer to have some sort of collectible, and for the most part, many of them don't really make a huge difference to the overall game. Even in a lot of recent Kirby games, all the levels seem to have one type of necessary collectible and another one that's done completely for aesthetic purposes. Here, this game don't fuck around. You're on a rescue mission, and honestly, it is such a smart idea. Making these captured Waddle Dees is incentive enough. I know these two have had struggles over the decades, but saving them is motive enough for me. I actually care about these things. Once you begin to save more and more Waddle Dees, they begin to populate the pseudo hub of the game, Waddle Dee Town. The more you save, the more this society develops. And why don't more games do this? There's so much to do here, with one of the most insane being the blacksmith shop. Ever since the introduction of the copy abilities in Kirby's Adventure, they've all remained relatively the same, even three decades later. And once costumes for these abilities were introduced in Kirby Superstar, the same would apply to them as well. Kirby in the Forgotten Land introduces an upgrade system for your copy abilities. Find the blueprints hidden in certain levels, get enough stars, coins, star coins, and star crystals, and that particular copy ability becomes much stronger. For as much as it shakes up the traditional Kirby formula, it feels almost right in a way. With how natural this addition feels, it's crazy to me that something like this hasn't been introduced into a mainline game until now. You also have a gun! I really like the gun. Waddle Dee Town has a lot more in terms of mini games, extras, and modes that even a year later, I haven't fully explored yet. And it's also the entry point to the secret final world. So the lion, remember him? He gets lost, I think. And Kirby is tasked with going into this weird dimension to find him. This is the secret seventh world of the game. Each level is a remix version combining all the different levels to its corresponding world in the base game with an amped up difficulty. Note that the difficulty here is for a Kirby game. And then once you complete that, hell on earth! Okay, maybe not Earth. Maybe Earth. Hell. So, yeah, they fumbled the bag a little bit the first run around, but this, this is fucking crazy, and it's actually difficult. It's a lengthy post-game quest that really does leave me satisfied with the contents of the game. The main boss for the main campaign just felt like it interrupted the game, like you're in the middle of a level and it just kind of turns into the final boss. Here, this feels like an actual fulfilling conclusion. Despite it being considered post-game content, completing it definitely feels more conclusive than what is offered in the base game, and having completed all seven of these worlds, I can confidently say that this is one amazing package. 
For a game that was initially low on my radar, Kirby in the Forgotten Land has been one of the most enjoyable games that I've played in recent memory. If you're a Kirby fan like I am, you need to play this game if you haven't already. And if you're just a general Nintendo fan, it is an extremely fun game you totally need to try out. Despite its bleak setting, this game still serves the joyful feelings of all previous games while feeling fresh and new for such a formulaic franchise. And although it wasn't tied with Kirby's 30th anniversary technically, it is a true celebration of the pink puffball. Thank you. 